This is why it's so common for guys to wake up with morning wood because they're in that rested state and they have to be calm. This is also why it's difficult for women to achieve arousal when we're stressed out because we can't get into that rest and digest state. I know that you've been carnivore for the last year and you've seen magnificent results. Have you seen any result with your sexual health and your sex life? Oh, yes. So <laughs> it's interesting. Um, if the body thinks you're starving, it's also going to store that extra energy. What can we do about it? This is the thing. Now, when it comes to what can we do about it, really the only answer is to... Before we start this episode, I just wanna say a big thank you for everything that we have achieved together. You see, two months ago, 75% of viewers had not subscribed, and now it's down to 71%. And our goal is 50%. So if you've ever liked any of the videos I post on this channel, please hit that subscribe button because as you've seen, the bigger the channel grows, the better the guests I can get for you. Okay, let's just get into the episode. Dr. Salt, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Now learning about you, there are so many things that you're great at, but there are three things that stood out that you are an absolute expert in. Fat loss, anti-aging medicine, and also sex and sexual health. So today I wanna to cover all three. But I wanted to start off with probably the most controversial topic, which is sexual health. And I wanted to start by asking, why do you think so many men and women have low sex drive? Oh, this is so multifaceted. So the way that I kind of like to approach this subject in general is that any degree of sexual dysfunction is going to be mediated by technically only three things. And it's your hormone function, your blood flow. Um, and I'm going to start with those first, because I feel like those are really like huge, huge topics. And then the third one is actually nerve conduction, um, which is like a lesser important thing, but it still matters. But the hormones and the blood flow are probably the things that we really see the most of. And hormone production, we know dramatically declines as a person ages. And not only just that, there's so many things that we do on a daily basis in many of our lives that are actually anti-hormone, if we can use a phrase like that. Um, things like being exposed to a lot of toxins in our foods, in our cookwares, women when it comes to makeup products or body products. I mean, there's a stat that I read somewhere that was like, women are exposed to something like 200 different toxins just doing their morning routine. And all of those are pretty much known as endocrine disruptors. So when we start to see how these hormones get attacked by all these things that we're exposed to on a daily basis, we lose things like production of our testosterone, which is like our main driver of a healthy libido, but also estrogen plays a role too. Same with progesterone, right? We need progesterone to keep us nice and relaxed so we can get into the mood for stuff like that. Uh, so that's kind of just one component. We can go deeper on any of these if you, if you really want to. Um, but the second one is going to be blood flow. Now, blood flow is predominantly the thing that we see with men when it comes to erectile dysfunction. They simply can't get that engorgement that's needed to sufficiently achieve and maintain an erection for the duration of sexual activity. And we usually see this as a result of poor lifestyle choices, uh, namely things like a guy getting into uh, prediabetes, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, because all of that really does damage the vessels, affects the blood flow. You can't maintain the erection. Obviously, we end up with sexual dysfunction. With women, it's slightly different. So men men and women's libidos vary in how we um, engage, I guess. Women are more responsive. So men will be in the mood pretty much no matter what. Women, we a lot of us don't operate like that, or if we did, it was when we were really young. Um, but we have to have necessary, we have to have a stimulus that we respond to. And what that stimulus is doing is it's actually pulling blood flow to the area. So any of our um, erogenous zones, so any sort of stimulation on nipples, anything stimulation on our external genitalia, anything like that can kind of get the libido going and get a woman engaged. And what's interesting is this blood flow is actually causing engorgement in those areas similar to how a man would, would experience an erection. What's also really interesting is it's that blood flow that actually creates lubrication. A lot of people don't know this, but female lubrication is actually an ultrafiltrate of blood plasma. So the more blood flow that comes to an area, the more of that plasma from that blood can actually go through those mucous membranes and create all that juicy lubrication for us. 
So those are those two reasons. Uh, third reason is nerve conduction. So you actually have to have that nerve signaling that tells you to go ahead and perform. So with men, we actually need, actually men and women, we need both parts of your nervous system to be adequately functioning. So what I mean by that is we have two main parts. We have our parasympathetic system and our sympathetic system. The parasympathetic system is our rest and digest. It's what keeps us calm. And we think parasympathetic and point. So for men, this is the actual getting of the erection. This is why it's so common for guys to wake up with morning wood because they're in that rested state and they have to be calm. This is also why it's difficult for women to achieve arousal when we're stressed out because we can't get into that rest and digest state. If you want to improve your hormones, increase sex drive, and also get faster fat loss results, you can achieve all of this with the four week fat loss course. You will learn how much protein and how much fat you need to eat in each meal to improve your testosterone, your estrogen, and also get you into ketosis. Your support also helps me bring more videos to you so you can achieve optimal health. There is a special link in the description where you can click and get 20% off automatically or just head to 5minutebody.com and use YT20 to get the 20% discount. Let's get back into the episode. Now, in order for actual orgasm or completion or ejaculation to occur, the body has to switch over to sympathetic during that process. And this is where the heart rate starts to increase. You get, of course, that really intense arousal sensation. And it's that shift into sympathetic that causes the shoot. So men to ejaculate, women to orgasm. So we need proper nerve conduction with that. Certain medications like um, SSRIs can really dampen this. We've all heard the term whiskey dick. <laughs> that can actually dampen your nervous system. I've never heard of that actually. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's a it's, no, it's a term. It's how time. well because alcohol is very much a central nervous system depressant. So you might be able, to, so you'll be actually too 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 relaxed to even get the erection, and it simply just doesn't want to perform. Um, and then so and even just general stress. We've all heard, you know, have pe people having uh, performance anxiety where they're in a stressful situation, can't get it up. Maybe it's a new partner. They're overthinking it. All of those things can contribute. So sexual dysfunction can kind of span the gamut of different issues happening. And some people, this is what we really work on investigating clinically is if somebody's dealing with that, which one of those three buckets are, is their dysfunction falling into? And a lot of the time it's a combination. So you really have to kind of unravel stuff to get to the root cause. So I'd love to know how, what diet and how diet plays a role in people's sex life, because I know that you've been carnivore for the last year and you've seen magnificent results. Yes. Have you seen any result with your sexual health and your sex life? Oh, yes. So it's interesting. Um, yes, there's definitely... I definitely feel a lot calmer. So there's definitely more relaxation um, with that. And I think it's so fascinating. Anxiety was an issue for me for many, many years. And I really do think that it was plant toxins. I was, I would always aim for like 10 different plants every single day. It was absurd. Um, and I did it like, cause I was thinking that's the right thing to do. You know, you think you're supposed to get eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables and grains and all that stuff. And um, it was only hurting me. And I was thinking about that this morning, actually, like it was about a year ago where I stopped believing in biohacking as a thing. Cause I used to do that. I used to be like a biohacker and I would do the biohacks, which is eat the vegetables, take all the supplements. I had all the supplements. I had so many biohacking toys, like you wouldn't believe it. And then I went carnivore and I stopped needing all of it because I wasn't poisoning myself. So of course you have to biohack if you're constantly being poisoned on a daily basis. Um, so I would say I'm a retired biohacker at this point, well, that's good. Um, but it's the, the sexual dysfunction stuff did change because I was simply just more relaxed because the anxiety went away. Um, there was some physical changes too, which is interesting. Um, I have nursed two babies so far. I've got a third one on the way that I plan on nursing. I also had breast implants that I have removed. So you would expect things to just be like less than ideal. And this might be TMI, but I think it's important because it speaks to just how healthy this diet can make you. And if anybody's ever had, or if anybody's ever looked into like, okay, what does breast health look like? Like what does a healthy breast look like? And if you're looking at somebody from a side profile, a healthy kind of lifted breast looks like their nipple is pointing straight forward and it's kind of parallel to the floor. So no real droop, no like, you know, other shapes to it. And I've still 
got that, which I, you know, again, maybe TMI for people, but to me, no, it it's not TMI. Things- I think people need to know this because I get questions around sagginess, loose skin, boobs, butter boobs, yep. all these things, high fat carnival, all the nutrients that we get. It's going to, it's like you're having liposuction. It's like having a tummy tuck and a boob lift all in one coming from diet. So it's not TMI. And if you're loving it, give us a thumbs up because please, this is what we need to hear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> The honest, the real conversation, and then the why behind it too. Um, Because you know what? I think it is important to share. And it's not like, I'm not going to post a picture of it. Like, I'm not going to like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you kind of have to take my word on this. But there's so many things that would go against that based on, again, nursing two babies, having implants put in, having them removed. Like, there's been a lot that's happened to that tissue. So for me to now be pregnant with my third, experiencing even another change in my breast tissue with them, of course, getting larger with pregnancy, that's just something that happens. Um, So for them to still have that, we'll call it perkiness, speaks volumes to what this diet can do just for, just for, again, I think it's part of sexual health, but it's also just generalized health because it means that those tissues are healthy, which ultimately means that at least I'm thinking that it's going to really reduce my risk for things like breast cancer stuff as I get older, because it's clearly healthy tissue. And now not to take away from the men watching this video, Mm -hmm. how does carnival help with men's sexual health? Oh, it's so good. So this is mainly the, so it's the twofold. It's the, it's the hormones and it's the blood flow, mostly the blood flow, because man, that is damaged so profoundly by excess carbs and sugar in the diet. I can't tell you, like when I get men who are coming to us for um, any sort of erectile dysfunction issues, and and usually they'll come to see us for things like uh, PRP or stem cells as an injection into the penis to actually heal up those blood vessels. It works phenomenally well, but you have to remove the sugar first because it basically acts like a hailstorm going through those really tiny vessels, just causing those nicks and those damages. And what that's doing is it's actually preventing those valves that are supposed to lock shut when you get the erection from holding that blood in place. So men eventually, one, they usually can't end up, they won't be able to even get the erection after a while, but they certainly have a very difficult time maintaining it. Um, And this will be even more obvious in certain positions where gravity is kind of playing against them. So a lot of the time, if um, the woman's on top and the guy's on the bottom, he won't be able to maintain the erection just because simple gravity is forcing against it. Mm. Yeah. And then the other aspect to that is the the hormone implication. So a lot of guys will have low testosterone, but like with guys in general, we know that small changes to their diet and lifestyle usually can produce bigger results. Like guys can think about going on a diet and they'll lose five, 10 pounds. It's crazy. With testosterone, it's almost the same thing. Like if you start cutting out all the bad food, start moving your body, doing a little bit of weightlifting, I've seen just those small changes increase testosterone levels by a couple hundred points, which can usually be pretty significant. Um, Usually we see erectile dysfunction start to happen when guys' testosterone levels hover between two and 300, which is low because optimal levels are between about 900 and 1100. There was also um, something very interesting about a carnival food, a carnival superfood that is apparently Mm -hmm. $1. That is going to increase our sex drive and our sexual health. So Uh what is that $1 carnival food? It's oysters. And we say $1 because they are every Friday at Whole Foods. We're actually recording this on a Friday. So it's technically Oyster Friday and we're probably going to go get some later. Um, Every Friday at Whole Foods, they're only a dollar. So if you have a Whole Foods near you in the United States, you can get them and they will shuck them for you. It's like the best deal in the whole store because we know Whole Foods is not cheap. Um, But we love them because they have a lot of minerals in them that will actually contribute to sexual function in a really, really positive way. And I really do think that, I mean, I've been taking, I take an oyster supplement. We actually have our own oyster supplement that we started and I'm not pitching this. I really am obsessed with it. I took it for six months personally before I felt confident putting my name behind it. Um, we source from a, from a marine biologist in Ireland and each serving, and it's actually really, like each serving is under $2 and it's equivalent to seven oysters per serving. So it's pretty, it's pretty significant as far as how much you're getting. And it's all bioavailable minerals that of course, as are found in nature, no fillers or anything in it. All batches are tested for heavy metals. Like they're, it's, it's really good stuff. But I think that is one of the things that actually did help with a lot of my issues too, especially as I was talking about the breast lifting experience that I've had um, because of all the copper that's in it. I was super mineral deficient coming into carnivore. And even after being carnivore for, 
a good six to eight months, I was, my levels were still completely tanked. Um, I just had a lot of repletion to do. I spent a lot of time eating plants that were blocking absorption of minerals, stealing my minerals. I birthed two babies. They steal your minerals. Um, so g- doing those, I think actually really brought a lot of that back. And copper is one of those uh, minerals that's actually really important for collagen production and formation. And I know that there's other minerals as well. Selenium, mm-hmm. um, zinc. Yep, selenium. Yes. Yeah. So iodine. Mm-hmm. Iodine. So iodine is very fascinating. So it's very important. I know with women that are going through menopause, people that have, because I know that Dr. Uh, Ken Berry, he was talking about iodine in that um, specifically when you're from different parts of the world, some areas have low iodine. So some people need to supplement with iodine. So does iodine also help with sexual health? It can. So the biggest thing that iodine is going to contribute to is actually thyroid health. But again, all of our all of our endocrine organs kind of work together in a symphony. So there is signaling from your thyroid to your sex hormones to everything else, even your cortisol levels, your adrenal your adrenal function. It's all kind of interlinked. Um, but the thyroid function is probably one of the more important ones because without your thyroid functioning optimally, you're going to be in pretty rough shape. Your thyroid has so much to do as far as your overall metabolism, your mood, your temperature. Uh, it's, it's really important for that. And a lot of people are deficient and it's simply because our diets are generally deficient. Um, you do find it in seafood, of course, like oysters and whatnot. So when you have somebody who's really on a very, uh, we'll call it like a animal meat based carnivore diet, you can still end up with those deficiencies. And I think that's something that's not talked about a lot in the carnivore community is that yes, you still can have deficiencies on this way of eating, even though you might be doing what you believe is the most optimal thing. I see that a lot in the YouTube comments and on every video when somebody says carnival is great, carnival is perfect, high fat is the way, then they'll say I'm not losing weight, I'm fatigued, I'm bloated, Mm -hmm. leg cramps, all these different things. And that's why thank you so much for saying that because I know people are going to resonate to say, you know what, that's me. I am in that camp. So what can we do if we are in that situation where carnival is not working, doing the oysters is not working, doing butter is not working, what can we do? Oh my gosh, there's so many angles to this. And like, I've been trying to like, I try to put a lot of content out there about these things, like what might be not happening. I have a whole post about like minerals you might be deficient in if you are on carnivore. Um, But I think like doing the like test, don't guess. That's my, that's my motto. Um, And I know a lot of people don't have access to testing. So what you can do, and this is what I've, I've taught people in one of my programs is take, go ahead and go to Google and empower yourself. I think it's important that a lot of people know how to research appropriately. Um, and so it's not a lot of it is going towards like opinion blogs, for example, but really you want to make sure you're looking at credible sources. So go and look up the first thing being, what are the essential nutrients that a body needs on a daily basis? And you're going to get a list of essential vitamins, essential minerals, essential amino acids, and a couple essential fatty acids as well. And then from there, you can Google, okay, what are the signs of deficiency of each of these? And you can kind of go through and say, oh, that one really sounds like me. That one really sounds like me. And you can cross-reference, again, I'm not like pushing my post, but like I have a post that says the most common one. Yeah, push it, push like, it, okay, it's fine. Could, <laughs> push it. I'm like, no, could this be, yeah, it's like, well, could this be the thing that I'm dealing with? And then experiment, right? Like if you really don't want to go ahead with testing, you have no choice but to go ahead and just experiment. And um, I know a lot of people don't have providers that they can work with locally that one, understand the carnivore diet or two, know how to do any advanced testing. Um, I do have a testing site that people can just like order panels and I do have carnivore focused panels on there. Um, So that is an option for people. Again, they're not cheap because of how much detail these panels do go into, um, but they do come with the consult to discuss the results too. So that is something that I've I've made available to people because I saw this need out there. There's a huge need, huge need. Mm-hmm. Now, if people don't love oysters, what is some other mm-hmm. cheap foods that people can have to improve sexual health, but also fat loss? Because we're, we're going to get into that next. Oh, gosh. I mean, I would say just take an oyster supplement, surely. Like they're, they're so strong when it comes to mineral production. And there isn't a lot of other really mineral rich meat sources. I mean, you could do like, like liver is going to be pretty high in a lot of different vitamins. Liver is going to also have a decent amount of copper in it too. Um, I actually do see a ton of carnivores. So again, I bought these carnivore panels. They 
carnivores buy them. I look at their labs. I have a whole bunch of data to back up the stuff that I'm saying. Um, but almost every single carnivore is very zinc dominant. And it's not to say that they are deficient in copper, but zinc and copper need to be in appropriate ratios. And then what I end up seeing is that their ratio of copper to zinc is completely defunct which means they're actually not going to get the benefits of either of them working appropriately. So we usually do have to correct for that. And sometimes it means they can go and they can have some beef liver instead, or they can take liver capsules. And a lot of people are okay with that. Um, or again, they can tend more towards seafood because seafood really is going to be the better option for those minerals. Um, and yeah, just giving that a try. Okay. Well now switching gears in terms of fat loss. Now, Yes. You talk about three things that block fat loss. What are those three things? So the main one is that for some reason, your body is storing extra fuel. Now that can be simply that you are overeating fuel, right? That's the most simple explanation. You are just taking in way too much and your body is like, you know what? We have nothing to, we don't need to use this for energy expenditure. So we're going to store it on the body as more energy. Um, but the other side to that is that if the body thinks you're starving, it's also going to store that extra energy because it believes that it needs to hold on to it. And this is really an intelligent design because it's meant for your survival, right? It's back from when there was famines and we really did need to have that extra fat on our bodies in order to make it through. So it sucks. It, it absolutely sucks. But what this means is that just like we were talking about, any level of micronutrient deficiency or even macronutrient deficiency, like protein hunger, for example. So um, not getting adequate protein amount will make your body think that it is in a starvation state and you will hold on to excess fat simply because it wants to store fuel. So what this often means for women is eating more than they ever thought that they were could eat. Um, and sometimes there is an adjustment period where the body thinks like, oh, wow, there's so much coming in. I'm going to store this as much as I can until you regain its trust. Your body then has to trust that there isn't actually a famine coming and it's safe to release that excess fat. And that's where we really start to see the big shifts happen when that like switch flips. And for some people it can happen faster than others, but that's the main reason. The second reason has to do with general hormone dysfunction. Your body will store excess fat during situations where certain hormones are imbalanced. And the most common hormones that will lead to this Thyroid is a secondary hormone. That's the thing most people think of, but thyroid dysfunction to, and storing fat is usually secondary to something else. Uh, it can be cortisol. It can be insulin. It can be an estrogen issue. So those are your, your big fat storage ones. And estrogen is something that we normally see when women start to experience menopause. And this is because estrogen is a super important hormone for women. It is our main hormone. It has like 500 plus functions in your body those functions don't necessarily go away when you hit menopause, right? This is why women develop Alzheimer's, develop certain cancers, get osteopenia, osteoporosis, because you lose those positive protective benefits of estrogen. So what the body does is it says, well, we need to try to make up for this because the ovaries have shut down their process. And there's a process that happens in the body called aromatization. And this actually occurs in fat tissue. So the body says, well, of course, like, we need more estrogen. We need to aromatize the other hormones into estrogen. Let's just put on more fat so we have more surface area to do it. And this is where we see those menopausal women rapidly put on that middle-aged midsection, you know, the fat around the stomach, the fat in the hips. And it's all the body just trying to correct for that low estrogen. So again, intelligent design, not ideal, right? Women would hate it. <laughs> yes, thinking. women hate it. <laughs> it's like, well, great. What can we do about it? This is the thing. Now, when it comes to what can we do about it, really the only answer is to get more estrogen in your system. There really isn't, there's some dietary strategies that you can do to kind of help push those pathways and to make things a little bit easier on your body. But your body is really never going to turn estrogen production back on because that is the state of menopause. So I am personally a big fan of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. I've been doing it in clinical practice since gosh, probably 2015 or so. So a while. And it's, it's great because it works well for keeping women healthy. I mean, if we can keep your physiology thinking that you're in your thirties or forties versus 
you know, being in menopause, you're ultimately only going to benefit from that because it's going to decrease other things that can happen in your life that can increase, you know, mortality risks like the dementia, the bone breaking, things like that. I mean, if you could completely take away your risk for a fall and a hip fracture, just by taking hormones, you have to feel better and look better in the meantime. I think it's a win. So hormones are, they are the answer to no hormones. Now, dietary strategies, like I said, can be effective as long as you're eating enough fat, but you absolutely have to put on lean muscle mass. Like that's a non-negotiable as you get aged. Um, I have a friend and she talks about how she's like training for menopause. Like you, you yes. really do have to make this a priority with your lean muscle mass. Cause that's, what's going to actually positively push things in the other direction. So that's really important. So we covered the, um, the, just your body storing ex extra fuel. We covered the hormones. The third thing is actually your body is creating surface area to store toxins. So there can be so too many toxins coming into our system. Like I said, there's things that we're exposed to on a daily basis in our shampoos, our conditioners, our face washes, our face creams, our eye creams, our mascaras, our eyeshadows, our body washes, our lotions, like literally everything. And when I'm working with clients, I like to tell them to reference um, it's the environmental working group, ewg.org. They have a database. It's called the Skin Deep Database tens of thousands of products on there, pretty much probably the stuff that you're normally using. You can see what the toxicity level is on there and you can actually look for products that are going to be cleaner. So you can really That's just make great. these big shifts. Yeah. It's a super great resource. Now still be discerning about some stuff because there are, there's always financial conflicts of interest no matter what. And so some of these companies will like, they get you know, these sponsored approvals, but they're still not necessarily great. But again, even just these mild improvements are going to be beneficial. So reducing the incoming toxicity is the first thing that you need to do. And then you can start working on the detox. Now, your body is always detoxing at every single point in time. We have a lot of detox organs, believe it or not. We lose toxins through our stool, through our urine, through our sweat, through our hair. And women will even lose toxins through their menstrual cycle, through their uterine lining. So basically anything that can come out of your body is a way for your body to get rid of toxins. Things that we commonly test for toxins, there's hair tissue mineral analyses. I don't personally love those. I, I like urine a little bit more because it can give us more detail. Um, and what the urine tells us is that yes, your body is actually actively removing these things on a daily basis because hello, it came out in your urine. That's how we know it's in your system. So again, it's not that you are not storing toxins. It's just how much is in your system, how much is coming out. And sometimes there might be stuff in other tissues that might not be readily removing it through your urine as much. But once we test, and again, you don't always have to test, but it's still useful because there's different ways to remove certain toxins in your system. So whether or not it's an environmental toxin, a heavy metal, even things like mold, mycotoxins, there's strategies for each. Like there's a reason that there are some doctors who specialize their entire career in just detoxing people because um, it needs to be done safely and effectively. But one of the reasons that your body will store fat is if you have too many toxins in your body that your body can't remove rapidly enough, your body doesn't want them in circulation. So it says, hey, we'll make more fat to just tuck these away for now. This is why when some people start to lose fat really rapidly on a diet, they start to feel worse because those toxins get released into the system. It's right. really interesting. Yeah. And we and you mentioned the mycotoxins. Um, I'm thinking of coffee. Mycotoxins yeah. in coffee. Can you talk about, because I know that you've quit coffee and you feel amazing and you had a really delicious coffee when you were actually having it with your husband. What are the changes yes. that you have seen by quitting coffee? Not saying people need to quit coffee because I know there's a lot of people loving their coffee, including myself, but yeah. coffee contains mycotoxins. It is. It can. It can, right? Yep. There's a lot of, there's a lot of brands that have been tested that have shown that they do contain that mold and the mycotoxins that come with it. Um, but you can look and you can find companies that make a mold-free coffee. Um, we would use Purity brand. I don't have any affiliation with them or anything like that, but um, they do third-party tests to make sure that they're clean as can be. One of the ways that you can kind of self-correct for that as much as possible is by buying whole bean and grinding for yourself because it's really the ground stuff that makes for a really great like moist breeding ground for those organisms to kind of populate in there. And it's so interesting because when I was in college, I used to go to, I used to go to Starbucks every day to study and I would get their coffee and I would have a headache every single day. 
And I never knew why. And then it wasn't until I actually saw a physician myself that they put two and two together for me. And they were like, yeah, you're consuming mold every day and it's giving you these headaches. I'm like, of course, like it's so, it's so obvious. So Starbucks, unfortunately is one of the worst companies for that. Their coffee is incredibly moldy. Um, But of course, any other coffee that is out there is likely if they're at a restaurant, a fast food place, um, any sort of coffee shop is probably going to be less than ideal quality, unfortunately. Um, But as far as benefits, man, so it's interesting. We read this book called Caffeine Blues, and it really kind of sets the stage for just how detrimental it can be. And, you know, just like any other type of poison or anything else that could be poisonous, the dose does matter. And what we saw was that in these, in the research that they did that promotes how good coffee is for you, the amount was only about five ounces. I mean, we don't know. I don't know if I know anybody that drinks only five ounces of coffee in a sitting. It's usually those 20 or 30 ounce, you know, cups, and maybe it's multiple times a day too. So completely overloaded, right? The things that I noticed at least initially with benefit wise was I was a lot calmer. Like it was just way more even keel for me. And I had more energy going into the evenings. So because I was no longer borrowing the energy from caffeine, I was actually able to generate my own energy and it was able to last me longer. So I was able to, you know, do work up and through seven, eight o'clock at night when before I would be like completely vegged out by like five or six o'clock. Wow. Now we we've spoken about the three things that actually create fat on your actual body, but what would be the best tips for people if they want to just lose fat? Like they're just so sick of having the belly fat, arm fat, thigh fat, whatever it is, because you have a lean physique, even though you're on your third pregnancy, I'll put a photo here right now for Dr. Salt. Amazing. (laughs) Give us three tips, three best tips to lose some fat. Yeah. I actually have a program where I teach this and it's it, we go through those three reasons. And what I do is I I will teach on exactly why it's happening. And then the second part of that is how we implement this in our, in our lives. So the, like I was talking earlier about the micronutrients that kind of comes from my program where I teach them, Hey, these are all the essential nutrients that your body needs on a daily basis. And then this is what the deficiency looks like. You need to make sure that you are eating in a way that's going to allow for that. And then I also provide a chart where it walks you through, like, these are the best sources of those micronutrients. So maybe add more of those to the diet. And I do emphasize the animal-based stuff because of course you can find these micronutrients in a lot of plant materials. They might not be as bioavailable and they might not be in high enough amounts to actually correct for your deficiencies. Because here's the other aspect to that is that you can eat enough on a daily basis to satisfy your daily requirements, but to be able to eat enough to actually correct for years and years, or maybe even decades plus of deficiency, you have to be so intentional with how you're curating your intake to be able to get to those goals. But it has to start with food. Now that's that. That's the first one is just figure out what you're missing <laughs> add that in, eat intentionally. Second one would be more towards um, hormone production and just like managing hormones. Um, Diet plays a role into that too, because once you start cutting out carbs and all these other things that you don't necessarily need, you're going to be taking away the fat storage effects of insulin by giving your body those intense insulin spikes. So that right there corrects for a lot, because at least you're not going to put on more what you might have if you were eating just the standard diet that you were previously. Um, But then of course, you absolutely need to start putting on some muscle mass. So when people, this is what people need to do when they plateau, because you can have people that go through a program, they lose weight initially, lose fat initially, and then they hit that plateau. They can't drop their intake any lower because they need to still meet their, you know, their basal metabolic rate. So then what you can do is you can raise your metabolic rate by raising how much lean muscle mass is on your body. So putting on more muscle mass, you're going to burn more calories at rest, which means your previous intake is actually going to help you get into more of a deficit so that you can burn more fat. Um, Intermittent fasting can work well for this. I don't love intermittent fasting for women unless they can be sure they are consuming enough during their eating window because we don't want a full like 24 hour caloric deficit or any energy deficit or protein deficit or fat deficit. We want a time period where your body is actually staying in ketosis to burn fat. And then a time period where you're fully refueling. So your body feels safe and nourished. So that would be the second thing is just doing that, that meal timing. Um, and then the third thing to help with the toxins again, it's just like I was saying, 
first start by eliminating them because your body's still going to work to remove this stuff on a daily basis. It just does. And you can add in other gentle detox strategies too. Like if you like to sauna, that's a really great way to start, you know, help get some of this stuff out, making sure you're drinking plenty of water and making sure you're pooping every day. Your, your, your elimination routes need to be open so your body can get those things out. Okay. So two questions there. Do you have to be in a calorie deficit to lose fat? I don't believe so. So calorie is a unit of measurement. It's not necessarily, oh, it's such a, it's such an interesting question. I don't believe in tracking calories as much as I believe in making sure you're getting adequate protein. If I was to tell people to track anything, it would just be protein. Um, because once you're consuming that, you're going to be correcting for so much stuff. So there's actually a study done, and I can probably get you the link for it, um, that talks about how protein hunger is one of the main drivers of obesity. So just by correcting for that, what you're going to be doing is you're going to obviously not be gaining any more fat, but you're going to be allowing your body to actually get into healing and repairing anything else that might be happening underneath so that your body does feel again safe enough to release that excess fat. It's, it's really fascinating to me because it works. <laughs> like I, it's so no, it funny. does work. Cause when you said that, I was just like, yep, that works. If you prioritize it protein works. and you eat enough protein, you'll feel full. And you see, this is a thing. I feel like you don't have to count calories, but I do think that energy matters, whatever label yes. you want to call it. it. Absolutely. Because it, mat- it also matters how your body is using the energy and where that energy is coming from, right? A thousand calories of protein is going to behave vastly different than a thousand calories of carbs from like, you know, popcorn or something like that. Like it's how it then signals to your body because a thousand calories of protein, you're really not necessarily going to get an intense insulin spike. That's going to store that as fat, but thousand calories of a processed carb. Absolutely. So this is where I think that, you know, you can be mindful of your calorie consumption, especially if, you know, I have a lot of women that I've worked with that, it's a really hard thing for them to break because they've been doing it since like the seventies or eighties. And so they have to like, look at the calories and look at the labels. And I'm like, that's fine if that's going to help you, but the calories need to come from these foods. You know, we don't want to be accepting calories into our system from somewhere else. Yeah. I see the opposite. I see people um, that eat way too much protein and eat way too much because they can just think they can eat as much as they want on carnivore <sighs> and then they don't lose weight. And I'm just like, well, I believe, I don't want to say calories, but if you eat 5,000 calories of butter, you're going to put on weight. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can still absolutely, yes. Yes. So (laughs) it's not like you can just eat anything you want because it's meat and you can't gain weight. You do have to be mindful of the satiety cues. Is that right in your opinion? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. No, I agree with that hundred percent. And that is something that, so I will sometimes teach women or coach women on intermittent fasting as a tool to learn what it feels like to be hungry in their body. Cause I feel like a lot of people lose that they've spent so much time in starvation diets, or they spend so much time overeating or using food to medicate emotions that they can no longer differentiate between what it feels like to just have an emotional response to food versus a true hunger response. Um, and yeah, I completely, completely agree with that. And there does have to be a balance. Like if you do eat too much protein, you are going to really turn up gluconeogenesis, which is going to basically create glucose, which means you're going to get a similar effect to consuming it. So Again, it's balance. It's learning these things. Um, and yes, people can still be doing quote unquote, all the right things, but if it's not what your body needs at that point, it's going to be way more difficult. Um, and especially, I mean, stress, like stress has a really, really big role in all of this too. None of this is going to work well if you are in a high stress state, because you are going to be going against what your body is trying to do, which is simply just keep you alive. So stress has to be dramatically reduced. Absolutely. And another thing I think that people want along with the fat loss is, you know, the anti-aging benefits. But I'm fascinated to know how does nutrients help with anti-aging or eating your minerals like oysters and seafood? Oh my gosh. Yes. So it's interesting because a lot of the people in the anti-aging field right now actually start have started to look at aging as a disease. And so we wonder, well, what things are then driving this aging process? And we see things like 
mitochondrial dysfunction, shortened, shortened telomeres, um, you know, the decrease of the hormone production. There's a term called inflammaging, which is how, how high levels of inflammation in the body promote the aging process. So if what we can do is actually look at, okay, what are the things that drive the process of aging? Then we could kind of reverse engineer the approach to say, well, if we correct for those, can we halt the aging process at least significantly enough so that, and again, if this isn't about people not dying, but it's about having a health span that's equal to your lifespan. So being healthy up until the day that you die, whether natural causes, whatever it is, versus having the last 10, 20 years of your life be, you know, a on pain medications, on other medications for chronic diseases, unable to walk, unable to do your basic necessities as far as caring for yourself, um, being in a situation where your joints are disintegrating and you you know, there's all of these things that this is where I think anti-aging plays in. It's about the quality of life that you're going to have once you've reached that middle age aspect, um, not necessarily a vanity thing. We see that the vanity stuff happen with people who are getting the Botox and the lasers. And not to say that those aren't cool. Like if you're into that, that's great. Like do those. But I think the anti-aging needs to be the internal processes where we actually keep your physiology behaving and functioning like you're still in your 30s or 40s. And how do we do that? <laughs> so this is such, it's such a good question because there's so many facets to that. Um, gosh, I forget what the exact number is, but there's like six or eight or even more reasons why we age. And like I said, mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere dysfunction, hormone stuff, the inflammation. And I think there's a few others that I am forgetting right now. Um, but you have, it's, you have to correct for all of these. So this is where the hormone replacement therapy comes in. This is where the healthy diet comes in reducing your inflammation, keeping your diet, you know, really on point with less, um, we'll call it glycation happening. So this is an interesting thing. There's some, there's these products that will actually get created in your body and they're called ages, A-G-E-S, and they're called advanced glycation end products. And these are, these are products that happen in your body that'll actually just force you into an, an aged state because they, the glycation process is like the caramelization process. And this is happening internally. And it really just makes things um, not function properly to say the least. So correcting for that, the, one of the best things is just carb reduction or elimination as much as possible being low carb. Um, and it's the combination of usually eating carbs and fat together that drive that too, which is one of the worst things you can do. So this is all, the, this is every hyper palatable food that's available in the supermarket. It's like any packaged food. If you look at packaged food, pretty much all of them are going to have a combination of sugars and fats, and it's going to taste really delicious, but it's going to make you age faster by creating these advanced glycation end products. So elimination of that. Um, like I said, hormone replacement therapy, making sure again, so detox is important and reducing toxins as they come in, because those will age you too. Um, one of the ways that they do that is actually by stealing your minerals. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that your body will store heavy metals as a way of just like trying to correct for mineral imbalance. So it's fascinating because a person with adequate mineral levels really won't sequester heavy metals. It's so so we, yeah, this is what's, I think it's super interesting. Um, cause after I got my minerals in place, I did a talk, I did a test on myself to see what my toxin levels were at almost no heavy metals considering how much seafood, seafood, fish and stuff that I do consume. Um, people would say like, there's no way, but your body won't take those in. It's almost like it tries to squirrel away whatever it can get in the absence of the things that it necessarily needs. We see this in a similar pattern with how we were talking about iodine. So if people remember the periodic table, um, there's things that are in certain rows that match each other. And so with iodine, things that are in that same row as iodine are things like your fluoride, your bromine, um, and they're similar. They're similar in their molecular structure, which means they're going to look similar to your body. So in the absence of iodine, we'll actually see the body store these other toxins like the fluorine and the bromine, which are predominant in our water supply, our toothpaste, preservatives, and even things like bread. Um, and we'll store those and those will then further make our thyroid worse. But when you start supplementing with the iodine and it's going to now properly bind, you're going to kick those out and the body will eventually detox them. 
that's why getting enough minerals and getting those nutrient dense foods, so the oysters, the beef, the liver, all those things is going to help flush out all of those heavy metals, toxins and everything. And it's going to help you look younger and feel great. Um, I was also yes. going to ask, what do you think about sun exposure, safe sun exposure? Does it aid you and sunscreen? Oh gosh. Okay. So it can. What I think we need to differentiate with this is there is a difference between a suntan and a sunburn. A suntan is a, just a physiological process of your body creating more melanin in response to a stimulus, not harmful in any way, shape, or form that we currently know of, or that can be backed up with data. But on the other hand, a sunburn, that's actually a pathological process where you actually have caused too much oxidative damage to those skin cells. And that can produce disease processes like certain types of cancers, um, sunspots, other aged things, even premature wrinkles. So I think there is absolutely a sweet spot between safe sun exposure. And I think the line that is burning or any sort of too much redness in the area, because you're increasing what we call oxidative damage. Now, can you correct for that? Absolutely. I mean, one of the hacks that I've used, not personally used for years, but recommended for patients, because I try not to, I really try not to burn myself, um, is glutathione. It's your body's master antioxidant. And it is one of the best things that you can take post sunburn to help reverse that oxidative damage. So and with that, even most other antioxidants can be really helpful too, but glutathione can work amazingly well. So making sure that you aren't burning. Now, I have a hard time seeing that I get where people get the the research that it ages you, your skin and it makes you look older and it causes wrinkles. I think it all comes down to safe and safe in the dosages. Like we were talking about earlier, like the do it's the dose that makes the poison. So if you are, you know, constantly in the sun every single day, and maybe you're not consuming enough stuff to correct for that oxidative damage that might be occurring, I think you can see an acceleration with that. And also what your general intake is when it comes to the fats that you're consuming. We know that consuming things like the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are found in things like seed oils will absolutely enhance how much you're going to burn. And then of course, wrinkles and stuff that can result of that because of how your cells have kind of rebuilt dysfunctionally using those bad fats. So I think that also changing, you know, the type of stuff that you're consuming really, really helpful as well. And that's why a lot of carnivores say that when they actually are out in the sun, they don't get sunburn because they're not having all those inflammatory agents that that's going to make you burn. So I think that's why. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm in my thirties. Um, I, I was a sun child my whole life. I worked at a tanning salon for literally years. I am not, you know, I'm how long? Five months pregnant at this point. Are you five months pregnant more. already? Yeah, I know, right? Oh my God, the time's gone um, so fast. I know. So like, you know, I, I clearly don't have any Botox or anything like that. And I feel like my skin looks pretty darn good for all those factors. And I think, I also think that, you know, I've looked at pictures of my face right like now compared to even when I was younger, so different. I think that there is absolutely an anti-aging aspect to being a carnivore, or at least, you know, consuming adequate amounts of the healthy proteins and the healthy fats. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Salt, how can people find more about you? Because I think they've learned so much. It's like an encyclopedia in what, 50 <laughs> minutes. This is an encyclopedia, like, textbook here. So how can they learn more from you? Where can they find you? Yeah. So, uh, I'm most active on Instagram. I try to share, you know, at least a handful of posts every week, um, on, on various topics. Um, I'm just at Dr. Solt on there, D-R-S-O-L-T. Um, at the time of us recording this, I'm actually not personally seeing patients at this time, but I do have staff that I have trained, um, that we can absolutely work with anybody who is, you know, interested in testing some of this stuff, diving deeper into some of this stuff. So we absolutely have that available. Um, my husband and I do have a YouTube channel and a Facebook group that we run for carnivores and it's a uh, carnivore harder, happier, healthier. So you can find us there. Hey. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, if you do have questions, so I generally, this is just like, like as a physician, I legally cannot answer specific health questions, but that doesn't mean don't necessarily message them to me because what I can do is create content that can help benefit hundreds, thousands of other people by answering your question in a way that provides 
greater information. Um, but I can't legally answer anything that's specific to anybody's care unless you are a patient. Um, so I just ask that people kind of respect that boundary, but definitely send the questions so I can have the, the content made. So no questions, no joking. It's in the questions. <laughs> but look out for Dr. Salt's uh, resources on Instagram, YouTube. There's so many information. There's so much info there that she puts just to help us all out. But thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure we're going to see you really soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. It's always so fun talking to you. <laughs>